Thank you very much. <laughs> um, good morning, colleagues. It's, it's great to be able to, to follow Polly, a great example of how we can collaborate with academic departments. I'm going to be talking about um, four things. I'm going to be looking at the three E's, employability, enterprise, and employer engagement. Um, these are dominating higher education policy at the moment, as you're aware, and I'm going to say why. You know, why? What's, what's behind these agendas? What's driving them? Where have they emerged from? Um, and, and why is it so important that we look at them? I'm then going to tell you all about a war that we're fighting at the moment, if you didn't know. We're at war for talent, uh, or at least many big graduate recruiters think they're at war. So I'm going to tell you all about that war and what it means for our students. Um, I'm going to talk about purists and players. Some of the new research has come out about how people get jobs and whether people need to change how they think about themselves in terms of jobs. Uh, and fi finally, I'm going to tell you what we're doing at the university in terms of the three E's, in terms of how we're bringing in employability, employee engagement and enterprise. And I've got an example of one of our uh, enterprising graduates who set up a business. I've got a case study of him that we're going to look at. So, so why now? Why have these agendas become so prominent now? Um, I've got some examples from government policy, uh, which is all about why employability is so important and the government have been talking about employability really for well over a decade now. But it's really begun to hit home in terms of universities fairly recently. So this idea that all universities must treat student employability as a core aspect of what they do is a fairly new idea, um, but I think it has, has key economic and social um, reasons behind this. Um, <laughs> universities are also being exhorted to promote innovation. Uh, and, and talk about employability, work experience, as we've just talked about, uh, and enterprise. So these agendas have emerged, and they're shaping the way that universities operate, even in research-intensive universities like our own. So what is employability? Um, can I just ask you here, does anyone know what it is? If you're asked what is employability, what would you, what would you say? For, for purpose, okay. And any other definitions at all? Right, okay. Is there anything else about employability? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll try and capture that, actually. I'll try, and, I'll try and come back to that. Definitions from ESECT, the, the government-funded organisation to promote employability, is nowhere near as, as dif advanced as, as that one. Uh, a set of achievements, skills, understandings, personal attributes um, that will make graduates more likely to gain employment and be successful in their chosen occupations. So that's the official view. And in developing the university's employability strategy, I've gathered together about 40 different definitions. It seems that, in a sense, no one's absolutely clear what employability is, despite the fact that it's, it's everywhere. Um, but there is a problem with employability. The question is, is it an absolute or is it relative? Is it something that you can actually gain, which makes you employable? for life? Or does it depend on the state of the job market? Does it depend upon what's happening around you? If I learn to speak French, that makes me more employable and in absolute terms, only as long as you can't speak French. Yeah. And, and I think these are the key issues in terms of employability. Is it, is it absolute or is it relative? Just to set the context of the graduate job market at the moment, I've got some key statistics that I think are worth just sharing with you, 2.2 million students in the UK at the moment in higher education. So the numbers have, have advanced massively. Being a student is now the world's number one occupation. Um, second is being a soldier in the Chinese army, if you wanted to know that. Just to, just to set that <laughs> in context. Uh, each year, 400,000 graduates leave UK universities. 400,000 is an incredible figure. Um, of which 59% come out with the first or two one. So you could argue that the majority are coming out with similar uh, levels of qualifications. They're competing for around 18,000 graduate level jobs. So these are jobs for which degrees are expressly uh, required by employers. So as my American colleague says, do the maths. You know, do the maths, she said. 
because the competition is incredibly lively. Um, in fact, this year we estimate the ratio of applicants to jobs at the graduate job market is 50 to 1. So it's, it's a very, very competitive job market. Um, it's also helped if you go to certain universities. So if this is research by Phil Brown at Cardiff, and he found that if you go to Oxbridge, your chance of landing one of these 18,000 top premium graduate jobs is one in eight. If you go to a new university, a post-92 university, what do you think the ratio would be? Okay. One. one in two and thirty-five. So it's a, it's a competitive environment and positional advantage shapes uh, your, your chances of getting one of these jobs. Where you study in many cases in the graduate job market is dependent on it, where you study is more important than what you study in many cases. 75% of all graduate recruiters say they want graduates from any discipline. So how does that work in, in that respect? So it brings me back again, is employability absolute? Is it something that you can gain which stays with you for life? Or is it relative? Does it depend upon the state of the market? Now you would think if you were a graduate recruiter that this would be a fantastic opportunity because you've got lots of graduates competing for jobs uh, and you'd be able to choose the best graduates. They think the opposite. Many graduate recruiters openly talk now about the war for talent and they've convinced themselves that they're at war for the top level graduates. Um, this idea was launched by McKinsey a few years ago and they launched a report called the war for talent. And this is, just like, have, have a couple of seconds to read this. I think as you read this, read it with a, a Churchillian accent in, in, in your mind. This is a graduate recruitment Donald Rumsfeld style. Uh, so, so they're talking about this war for talent that they're, that they're locked together fighting for. So they're, fight, they're looking for these top graduates. Um, and it's always amazed me. 400,000 people leaving universities every year. 2.2 million students competing for 18,000 jobs. Why is there a problem in terms of getting hold of graduates? Why is there an issue in terms of this? Well, I think Keith Dugdale, who's the National Graduate Recruitment Manager for KPMG, lets the cat out of the bag. He says that demand's expanded from employers, but the absolute amount of top talent has remained static. In other words, graduate recruiters think just because the market's expanded doesn't mean to say that the actual ability or the talent has expanded. And that's triggering the war for talent. If you're at war, you need weapons. And this is what organizations have formed. They've formed their own weapons of mass rejection. So organizations, if you've got all these applicants applying for jobs, they've developed their own weapons of mass rejection in order to cut down the number of applicants. And I've got a sample of some of the weapons of mass rejection that are being used this year uh, with our students. So I've compared it over the last decade just to give you an idea about what people have to go through to get a job offer. Some of the big shifts you'll notice, the rise of online applications, uh, telephone interviews are very popular now, particularly with city banks. Um, some have been telephoning students up on Saturday mornings, which is a great way of assessing your communication skills. Uh, online exercise, personality tests, numeracy tests, um, again, these are offered to graduates from any discipline. And we've come across stories of graduates with first class degrees in maths failing numeracy tests. Uh, I think because they're nervous. I think it's, it's a nervous environment. Um, and assessment centres. Assessment centres are a huge business these days. The companies Polly talked about use assessment centres to recruit. And this is when you go away for two days in some sort of rural retreat and you put through a whole series of different assessments. Uh, to look at your ability, how you communicate, and so on. These were first designed by the German army in World War I, and assessment centers for the German army used to culminate in electric shocks to see how, how strong you were, they would electrocute you. Today's assessment centers do something far more painful, and they have a meal with all the employers, and many of our students say that's the worst part of the whole two days, having a meal in a formal environment. So the job market is increasingly competitive and a whole series of, of, of cultural ways of assessing people are being used by employers. This is a test that's currently used by some graduate recruiters. I thought I'd just see how you would cope with this. This is the opening equation and your task is to choose uh, which of the five options is the right answer. 
you have 60 of these in, a, in an hour. And this is one of the easier ones. Has everyone, is it, has everyone got this? Is anyone thinking, where's the words? <laughs> yes. Okay, what, what, what do you think? What, what's the answer? C. C, right? Uh, it's, it's B. I'm sorry about that, Polly. <laughs> So you could be saying, what's this got to do with my degree, in, in many respects? I, you know, we didn't cover this on, the, on, our, on our course. But these are used in the graduate job market and they're very effective tools of, of assessment for employers. Um, yes, yeah. We have a whole battery of these tests um, that, we, that we run throughout the semester so students can come and practice them. Right, well, I can tell you about them. We have personality tests, um, which you can't fail. If anyone's worried about failing a personality <laughs> test, by the, you can't fail them, but you can certainly fail the uh, cognitive tests. So we've got a battery of cognitive IQ type tests, which um, wh why not come and do them yourselves? Why not come and try them out yourselves? We'll be very sensitive with the results. <laughs> but I think it's worth looking. Yeah. I must admit, I showed this with a class, quite a few of them. Um, I showed it with some um, master's research students the other day, and they got it straight away, which was re which yeah really depressed me actually. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah right. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's right. And they said, oh yeah, we like these. And they said, have you got any more of those, Paul? Because they, they thought it was fun doing this. Uh, <clears throat> Employers use other means, however, of, of recruiting graduates. And sociologists are talking about the commodification of the self in the graduate job market. So or the, or the, the short word um, is a brand called me. Thinking about yourselves as a commodity in the graduate job market is now a very powerful idea in terms of recruitment. And I think this diagram. Um, demonstrates some of the issues which are happening in the market at the moment. Perhaps when I was a student, what you needed were hard currencies to survive in the graduate job market. You needed qualifications, um, credentials, work experience, contacts. Today's graduate job market, in order to create a narrative of employability, soft currencies uh, are assuming far more important. So personal skills, appearance, dress style, how you come across, how you cope at the, meet, at the meal with the partners, um, that is assuming far greater importance. There's some good research by Anthony Hesketh at Lancaster who's talking about this and he argues that as companies are focused on building their brands, they're increasingly looking for people who complement their brand. So people who, who project the brand image or the knowledge brand is assuming far more importance. And I pursued this with employers to try and see whether it resonated with them and it was quite interesting looking at some of the quotes from them in terms of what they look for from a graduate. Um, so the thing that Polly was talking about would definitely position your students in this market. But this idea of what it, this little bit extra, what, what is that little bit extra? And it, um, wonderful things like going on jungle treks in the final gap year. Um, so companies are very keen to, to be available for diverse applicants. But if you're a, an older student, if you've got a family going on a jungle track, it's perhaps not the top of your priorities during your final year. Uh, there's also a, a checklist in, or, or, or a league table of extracurricular activities which firms enjoy or, or prefer people to do. And I've got some quotes here from some of them. Um, so tennis and rowing are in. Uh, playing snooker is out. Why do you think that is the case, do you think? Well, does anyone? Mm. Yes. Yes. It is, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yes. Oh, yes. Dart, darts isn't even feature on the list. Darts doesn't even. <laughs> but this idea of. <laughs> this idea of having. Yes, it is, having done something with your life. But that's a very subjective judgment, isn't it? What constitutes having done something with your life? Is it raising a family? You know? Or, or is it a jungle trek or climbing Everest and so on? So, so the idea of the commodification of the self is increasingly important. And some researchers are saying, well, this is changing the way that we need to talk to students about employability. It's changing the, the way that we need to um, conceptualise it with them. Traditionally, the argument goes, people have been purists when approaching the job market. Increasingly, though, we have to help people become players. Some universities are openly coaching their students so they can be better players in the job market. And I've been quoting this research with our students. And I've noticed that we have these two categories, purists and players. These are some of the purists who, who I spoke to. Uh, and I was talking to them about the job market. And these were the quotes that they were coming up about. So quite a few were saying, you, you've just got to be yourself. You know, I am who I am. If they don't like me, then that's it. It's probably a good thing that I didn't get the job. Some of them almost want not to get the job because it'll prove that it wasn't right for them in the first place. So they, they taught themselves out of it. Um, it wasn't meant to be. I love this idea of some celestial job agency choosing. Uh, you can only do your best. You know, I am who I am. And I, I think many of us perhaps would identify with these uh, phrases. However, increasingly I've noticed the emergence of players. Um, and I think there are, there are key reasons for this. I think there's, I'll, I'll talk about enterprise culture, which is changing the way we think about jobs. But recruitment is just, just, just a game. Uh, and we're the players. It's a real Generation Y approach. It, this is a game, and you have to be who you have to be to get the job. Okay, so, so it's not a reflection of me as, as a person, it's me in order to get that job. Uh, I'll be whatever they want me to be, so long as I get the job, some students said. How do you feel about that? Do you, can you recognise players or purists in yourself? Do you? <laughs> some, um, some players admitted that they started out as purists, but they've changed because they saw other people playing during the competition. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's not yet. Yeah, and, and that would be our position with it. Um, but they, they, they come with this idea, I think, from, from a whole series of different developments that, that give them this insight into the job market. Yeah, they, they are. Yeah. It, I mean, that's it, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, if a purist could say, well, it's about being me and being happy, and and, and the, yeah.